Welcome again to our service. Let's begin by praying together the Collect for Purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's say together, Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. My dear brothers and sisters, The scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses, not concealing them from our Heavenly Father, but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts that we may obtain forgiveness by His infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God, but especially when we come together in His presence to give thanks for the great benefits we received at his hands, to declare his most worthy praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace. We pray for the forgiveness of our sins. Let's pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's reaffirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Once upon a time, a woman went into a thrift store filled with second-hand items. She was looking for something in particular, something for the mantelpiece in her home. And after wandering around for some time, she thought she saw just the right thing. It was a small ceramic vase, about 10 inches high. Someone had obviously used it for holding greasy tools in the garage because there were still some nuts and bolts inside. 
It was so covered with dirt and grease. The piece was obviously not given a second chance by most of the customers in the store. The woman, disguising her absolute delight in her thrift store find, went to the cashier and bought her treasure. Then, taking it home, to her even greater delight, noticed at the bottom of her so-called tool holder an engraved stamp revealing it was a fine piece of antique porcelain, in fact, quite valuable. Thoroughly pleased with her great fortune, she cleaned and polished it up and then displayed it on the mantelpiece. A perfect touch to her living room. Now imagine that the original owner of the piece had turned up at the thrift store the next day and asked for his vase back because he missed storing his greasy tools on the workbench in his garage. The shop owner might direct the man back to the woman who bought it yesterday. Of course, she would be perfectly in her rights to say that it was no longer available. After all, not only did she purchase the piece, she had cleaned it inside and out. She had restored the vase to its proper use. It did not seem right anymore to use it for greasy tools. Guess what? You and I are like that porcelain piece. We have been bought back, but of course with a higher price. It's like we had been used for all kinds of purposes other than those for which we were created. But God came into the secondhand thrift store looking for us and had paid the ultimate price, his son. Jesus said, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Let's pray before we look closer at the gospel according to St. John chapter 15. May the words of my mouth and the meditations in all of our hearts be truly acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So we're looking at the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 15, verses 9 to 17. But just a bit of background first. It's not clear from the narrative where Jesus exactly was when he gave this teaching. The end of chapter 14 makes, marks the point of departure from the Last Supper in the upper room. So it's possible that later, Jesus and his disciples were passing by a grapevine, which was then used as a spiritual illustration. Chapter 15 begins with Jesus saying, I am the vine. And its significance can be appreciated against the background of the Old Testament idea of Israel as a vine or vineyard. Jesus was the true vine in the sense that he was fulfilling his mission, his mission as compared with the Israel of his day, which had not acted in harmony with its divine calling to be truly the light of the world, to exemplify the goodness of God, the law of God. It's like the precious vase being used for all kinds of other things other than its calling. Jesus was the reality of which Israel was but the type. In our passage today, here we find Jesus' intimate instructions with his disciples because his death is close at hand. Within hours, Jesus will face the cross. So, Jesus is sharing his heart with his beloved disciples before he leaves them. Obviously, what he is saying is of utmost importance. So, beginning at verse 9, it says this, As the Father has loved me, 
so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. So, point one. You have been bought with a price because you are so loved. Jesus carefully selected an image that conveys himself and his message, the cross. It represents the lostness of humanity as well as the sacrifice that God made to buy us back. It also represents the sacrifice that you and I must make as we follow Jesus. You see, ideas and images are powerful ways of communicating the truth. So on the negative side of this, the evil one, the devil, also uses ideas and images to distort and trick us into despair. So think back to Genesis chapter 3, when Satan, in the form of a snake, tried to trick Adam and Eve away from God. He didn't hit them with a stick, but with an idea, an idea that God could not be trusted and that they must act on their own to secure their well-being. The single most important thing in our mind is our idea of God and the images associated with it. Let me repeat that. The single most important thing in your mind is your idea of God and the images associated with it. The cross... The image of the cross must be within our minds because the Lord has bought us with such a high price. He laid down his life for you and me because he loves you so, so much. You know this. So notice in the passage how many times Jesus uses the word love. Nine times the love of God for you, our love for God, and the command to love other people. Next section. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But... I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. He chose us, of course, because he loves us. He chose us as his friends. The operative word here is friends. Whereas servants blindly obey, Friends are taken into confidence. And that is what Jesus is doing here. Because he chooses us. You did not choose me. I chose you. And just a side note on that verse. Over the years, you might have been asked why you chose Christianity. Or why you chose to follow the Lord. In some, in some ways, I know where people are coming from. But on the other hand, the Christian religion is not like some item on a supermarket shelf that we can pick and choose and, and put into our shopping basket. We wouldn't use those kind of terms for our family and our friends. Because 
Christianity is all about a personal relationship of love and commitment to the one who loved us so much. And you know that our friend, the Lord Jesus, who commands us to love and to remain in his love, acted out the greatest thing that love can do. He gave himself sacrificially on the cross so that you and I could live. The process of us growing up into more and more Christ-likeness is one of progressively replacing destructive images and ideas with the images and ideas that fill the mind of Jesus himself. And so love and friendship with God fill Jesus' mind. I believe that is the biblical ideal for your life and mine. To know God so closely, like that old hymn that says, He walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. The flip side of that relational coin, as it were, is that Jesus makes clear that this relationship is a moral one as well. To be bought with a price means we too have a responsibility to live a holy life, a very different way of life. No more greasy tools and and, and dirty tools. When you obey my commandments, Jesus says, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. And here, Jesus draws a parallel between remaining in him and his remaining with God the Father, a relationship characterized, in his case, by obedience. And it sounds to me that remaining in him is conditional upon obeying. And amazingly, Jesus tells us that obeying him leads to freedom and joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. It's difficult for many people to accept the fact that trying to follow and obey Jesus leads, in fact, to freedom. It seems counterintuitive. I believe that the more we try to live Jesus' way, as described clearly in the pages of the scriptures, out of love for him, the more we center our lives within the will of God, and this brings true freedom. Last part, verses 16 to 17. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. And, adding verse 17, these things I command you so that you will love one another. These, of course, are Jesus' parting words with his dear friends. He says that he has appointed them to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father would give them whatever they asked for using the name of Jesus. And of course, this is all about mission. We would be wrong with just interpreting this passage solely on our inward relationship with the Lord. It is that. But its real thrust is the renewal of the mission of Israel through Jesus as the Messiah and his disciple community, which, of course, includes you and me. Now, fruit bearing is many things in the Bible. It's reaching out to people. It is about justice. The prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament makes this connection. He says this, 
The nation of Israel is the vineyard of the Lord and his pleasant garden. He expected a crop of justice, but instead he found oppression. He expected to find righteousness, but instead he heard cries of violence. To be a true fruit bearer is to produce fruit, which means to live and work for justice. And did you know that justice and righteousness are very similar in meaning? We tend to think of justice as only about feeding the poor, etc. But it's actually more about living as God would, as if he were walking around the earth. And of course, we know that Jesus did exactly that. So he fed the poor. He healed the sick. He spoke words of encouragement. He lived a life of justice and righteousness. And so also, fruit bearing is about character. Galatians chapter 5, very familiar passage. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and everyone's favorite, self-control. You see, I did a little bit of background check and looked up the word self-control in the original Greek language. And do you know what it really means? Self-control. This is the kind of fruit-bearing that lasts and honors the Lord. It actually brings glory to the Father and to the Son. Character, character really, really matters. Your character, my character matters in the kingdom of God. So let me return to where I started. We are bought with a price. Like that simple porcelain vase in the thrift store that turned out to be so, so precious and valuable. So before we pray, consider your thoughts and your images of God. While the Bible is filled with all kinds of different images of God, such as, remember, a pillar of fire or a cloud of glory and a whole host of other things, be honest with yourself. What really comes to mind when you think about God? You see, for many people, God is like a king who's too busy for them personally, or a clever boss who shrewdly gets his employer to do things, or a hard-edged teacher who demands too much. Perhaps God is even distant, too busy to care about you. Give some thought for a few moments to what ideas drive your image of God. So finish this sentence. God is the kind of being who? The process of growing up into more and more Christ-likeness in our lives is one of progressively replacing destructive images and ideas with the images and ideas that filled the mind of Jesus himself. So, as we pray, ask the Lord to show you what you think about when God comes to mind. Think about those images. And once you recognize them, and if that image needs to change, consider new images that represent the true self-sacrificing love of God. As we wait on the Lord in prayer right now, let's listen to what the Lord would share with you and with me. Come, Holy Spirit, we pray. Show us, Lord, how we think about God. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our hearts and minds with your glorious presence. Would you open the eyes of our hearts that we might truly see 
the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we pray all of these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Let's continue our service in the words of the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In the words of the prayer of thanksgiving, let's pray. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all of your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge of God. The peace of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Well, God bless you and have a wonderful week.